You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. I'm Jared Mounts. Where there's Jake's Bait and no tackle. script and we just basically talk until they tell That's us right. to stop, right? And we go for quite some time. So Yeah, we do. We, we, we really do. So we got a really cool guest in there, don't we? Yeah, you know, just another uh, young man that I met at the bait and tackle shop here, Ryan Feehan. Welcome, Ryan. How you guys doing? Great. I mean, you know, and you walk in, I didn't realize at the time when I first met him, but you soon find out that he uh, is on the Virginia Tech uh, fishing team. And so this going back, and I think, man, that's impressive, you know, because they got a pretty big squad, pretty big team. Uh, very successful mm -hmm. and so we kind of you know talked and and with my involvement with the frederick county uh, junior bass uh team you know asked him if he'd be willing to come in and talk to those those kids because we got a lot of young kids that you know some of them uh, have aspirations of going to fishing beyond high school type of thing so he came in and did talk to the kids and talked to them specifically about smith mountain because i think we were going down to fish fish that in a qualifier and so, but yeah, he's full of information, knowledge. And since then, since first meeting him, he is, and he comes in periodically and shops with us. Uh, he's had a ton of success on Smith Mountain Lake. He obviously, and you know this, fishing at a high level and collegiate bass fishing competitively. And uh, they won a state championship on smith mountain lake with 20 plus pounds 2279 dang dude and that qualified them for the national tournament so we want to get into that too and so he's he's not just on the team he's uh you said you're ranked what in the nation ranked second right now second. virginia tech is that is awesome. well, congratulations that's yes, really awesome that to get is ranked. really cool because especially like it's hard like and this is something i don't know like this might have changed since i was actually in college but it's not just d1s versus d1s mm -hmm. it's pretty much any school and i think it's still that way correct where it's any that... school so we're ranked second right now in the mlf uh college series so that's out of every school Everyone. that's fished an mlf event that's yeah. freaking that's awesome, awesome dude congratulations yeah, that's that is awesome representing virginia yeah so, so tell then, us a little bit about yourself to get us started, kicked off here. Yeah, Who's well, uh, I'm youngest of four brothers. Let's uh, state that simply. Uh, we've always done everything outdoors together. Uh, starting way back when I was a kid, I couldn't remember the time I didn't have a fishing rod in my hand, for being honest. And uh, one of my key memories when I was growing up is just going to the neighborhood ponds with my brothers and my dad and my mom, actually, too. She would get out there and just going fishing. I mean, throwing a pink Mr. Twister like a two inch pink Mr. Twister. I mean, that was one of my first memories of catching bass way back when Love I was it. a young buck. So can, I, can I add that? Like you keep telling about the memories, like the pink Mr. Twister. Like we always have that core memory about fishing. Absolutely. It's all about the and family and the fish. For me, it was a fish. yellow Mr. Twister, but, but it was a Mr. Twister. <laughs> oh yeah, it I was mean, Mr. Twister. Or purple warm. What, what area was this? Uh, oh. I, I've grown up and lived in Northern Virginia my whole life. Okay. So okay, I gotcha. grew up in Fairfax, Centerville area oh, wow. um, until I turned 10, got a lucky chance to move out uh, closer to the mountain range. Uh, uh, live at a uh, haymarket now okay. and uh growing up and just made it through high school fishing mm. every day got my first tournament when i was uh my senior year and ever since i mean i was hooked actually so like um, junior year junior year but i was hooked ever since having a rod in my hand and i knew uh right when i uh was getting ready to graduate col uh, high school i wanted to go fish college That's cool. um like you said earlier i uh i grew up playing sports Mm -hmm. So Kicker. fishing, fishing was never my number mm -hmm. one. Um, I loved football. I loved kicking a football through the uprights. What was your longest field goal? Uh, in a game, uh, only over 42 yards, That's give or take. So uh, yeah, it was a tie the game for uh, awesome. triple overtime. So it's pretty lucky. There you go. But uh, I mean, in practice is consistently hitting them 60 yards and wow. uh, I was getting looked at by schools and I hurt my back sadly and uh, stopped playing sports all around and uh, just said, you know what, I want to go to school and I want to, I want to go fishing at Virginia tech. And I mean, I made it. So that how did you awesome. be, how do you become a kicker? Like, you know, I'm always curious about that. It's... It, it runs in the family. Shockingly. Huh. Uh, I got four, three older brothers and, uh, two of them before me were kickers. Hmm. Uh, we played uh growing soccer, playing soccer growing up. And, uh, I mean, they got into it when I was in the eighth grade and I was just like, I want to do this. Okay. So I was out, I was out there with them. They were in there training, and I was just kicking the ball, and uh, got lucky enough to be varsity freshman sophomore year, sitting behind my brother, and uh, 
junior year came around it was my time to shine and uh i stepped up and i loved loved playing the sport man putting on the helmet and pads every day is that same feeling i get now when i uh, grab a fishing rod i think it's the same thing and i strive for any kid to have a passion when you uh when you're out there just mm -hmm. take it to take advantage of it while you're there man because when we were when we were kicking each one of us were good my brothers went to college for it um, so I got to watch them go play college football, mm -hmm. one at uh, Bucknell University and the other, other at Shepherd. Mm -hmm. And uh, by my senior year, I was like, you know what? I want to go fishing instead. Mm -hmm. So I really found a niche and I loved it. So hmm. Sounds like somebody else I know sitting over here oh, gosh. in college and <laughs> yeah. was a catcher and uh, started the fishing team at Shenandoah. But that's the other thing I love about fishing. We always talk about like you still have the competition, mm -hmm. but you're on an equal equal playing field from the standpoint that it's not the biggest fastest strongest out there you know to rip some lips so like it's it's uh so you know kids out there i mean you can be an athlete but you don't have to be an athlete you know so that you can get involved in this sport of fishing and go out and catch fish and be good at catching fish and compete at a high level and be successful mm -hmm. uh, i think that's really cool no, there's not too many sports out there where you can you can do that so that's pretty cool so well, if you oh go ahead no bro. yeah so yeah. i mean like you said you can be an athlete and uh i get a hold it over my brothers that i have a state championship there now and uh, i get a hold over my brothers that i get to go to the national championship that's right. they didn't get to do that playing football so that's, that's for good. one that's thing right. i'll always have on it and i'm excited to say that what like walk us through i mean we got the time so walk us through the whole college experience like starting day one on this fishing team yeah. or whatever do you just waltz in there and like try out like for my situation it's easy i just built it and there's only two people so it's very Started easy to make a team it, yeah. but yeah for a big school what is that like well uh sadly i didn't get into virginia tech on my first try okay. i got waitlisted and uh for you know, fishing or school or for both? school okay. man for school <laughs> i was a smart kid i mean graduated three eight and i was happy with wow. it and uh just didn't get in so i uh went to community college and just worked at cabela's for a full year just uh okay. stocking up on fishing lures and uh, smart my goal was to get to virginia tech and i i did it so i reapplied and i got in and uh first thing i did was i contacted our fishing team um easiest way to do that's through our instagram and stuff like mm -hmm. that you just get to contact them and they'll they'll set you in the right direction for when you need to show up to a meeting and things like that and uh really great program at virginia tech uh we get to uh fish no matter what in the spring we do club events and uh you just got to pay the dues to fish so it's no tryouts um when it rolls around to these bigger style tournaments these mlf and college bass events uh that's when you really got to shine through if you don't have a boat um, because in the fall you get randomly selected a partner every other tournament every tournament and uh you get to make friends and you gotta build that team camaraderie that we have now and uh i can say i love every guy on our team they're all great people so we may you make friends in the fall and you get, get a fish with everybody on the team almost like hmm. i don't think there's a guy on our team i haven't fished with and how many are we talking uh we got uh seven boats that travel right now okay. um but about 40 plus people usually wow. on wow. the team uh my best year i saw 80 at the beginning of the year wow. that was my sophomore year and uh this year i think we got it right around 37 to 40. wow but we got six to seven boats that travel to every event that we get the chance to go to so uh you just pay the dues and you get to show up and fish with buddies and uh when it comes to these spring events they're held by mlf and college bass uh and uh, bass pro shops they all hold these events but you get to pick your partner when it comes to them so if you don't have a boat uh you kind of get to feel out the crowd and make friends with people and you get on a buddy's boat and uh i was thankful enough this year to be able to fish with uh two different people and uh we got to let me borrow their boats and we did really well together because it's a team event. College is two people on a boat and you can't do it by yourself. So it got really lucky this year and it's always been a great time at Virginia Tech. So so then like first year that, that you get, oh, yeah. how many years did you uh, compete? So I got three years, three years? Okay. but um, sadly the first year there was no major tournaments that I got into because of COVID. Gotcha. So my sophomore year, COVID struck in the spring semester, and that's when all the MLF events happen. Mm. Um, I didn't get a fish. I only got a fish the state championship my sophomore year. Finished third. Really rough day, man. It was on Smith Mountain Lake, by the way. All these mm -hmm. uh, state tournaments are held at Smith. It's best lake in Virginia. And uh, really unlucky day. I had my tracker out there, my 17-footer, and we got, I don't know, 
20, 30 mile per hour winds mm. at its highest and wow. uh, blew us off our spot. But we fished it for an hour and caught 15 pounds. And I, I still think about mm. only if I was able to get back out there, yeah. what, what that day would have been like. Cause my last cast out on those points was a six 13. Mm. And, uh, that day really, I, it doesn't sting, you know, you, you lose a bunch, but it, mm. I just, I knew the potential of that place. Yeah. Cause I was catching a fish every fifth cast. It was so awesome. What was your experience before going to tech with Smith Mountain Lake? And cause it seems like that became your home water. I don't know if it was beforehand. I, I had never fished Smith Mountain Lake okay. before I went to Virginia Tech. Wow. I, I uh, young kid, really didn't get to travel much for fishing when I was in high school. I didn't, they didn't have those junior leagues. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't that big mm -hmm. of a thing. My school didn't have a high school team. So I was kind of just fishing BFL. I fished my first BFL my junior year. Uh, and I really never got out of the Potomac River, uh, Lake Frederick right around here, mm -hmm. uh, Germantown Lake, uh, Lake Anna. But that's really it, man. I didn't get to mm -hmm. travel that far for fishing. So right when I got into college, it was a rude awakening seeing different water. Mm -hmm. um, but you, like everyone, you adapt. And uh, I quickly became, my first tournament was that uh, we do club events there. And I did pretty well, my first Smith Mountain Lake tournament. And I just ever since have come to love it. Every time I go there, I'm guaranteed to fish and guaranteed almost a five pounder every time. It's It's wow. just a beautiful place. How, what was the learning curve for that place? Well, dirty water, Potomac River. Uh, you're used to throwing 50 pound braid, flipping yeah. hydrilla and lily pads and throwing frogs. I've never thrown a frog on Smith Mountain Lake. I've never tied a rod besides spinning rod that has braid on at Smith Mountain Lake. So uh, from people listening that don't know, you got 10 foot clear waters a lot of the time there. I mean, six foot is probably average, but when you get down near the dam, mm. um, below the Roanoke side of the river, uh, you just, you see clear water and you got to really adjust to that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, my adjustment to it was, uh, understanding that I needed a longer leader. Cause I mean, five, six feet was all I was throwing on the Potomac with 10 pound test. I strictly throw like eight to six pound on my spinning rods now with about 20, 25 feet sometimes hmm. of line, just because when that fish gets near the boat, I want to have my fluorocarbon and my knot already in my reel. Mm -hmm. So when it, so I have like the utmost control over that fish and their only breaking point is the hook. So that's like something I kind of adapted to with my spinning rods. Um, you can still throw heavy fluorocarbon there. I found it doesn't matter that much if you're throwing a reaction style bait. Like uh, we'll get into it a little bit later, but like 20 pound test on some of my rods is 25 pound test fluorocarbon and monofilament. You can throw that, okay. but uh, jerk baits, 10 pound test, really light stuff. Sometimes I'll even throw them on eight on a spinning rod. Uh, that's a lot of the winter stuff is really finicky fish, but it fishes really fast. I have found hmm. people, uh, tend to think about like, oh, I got to hit this one point and I got to fish it 10 times. Man, if you catch two fish on a point there, sometimes you did good. Hmm. Um, and then uh, that's like early springtime. Uh, you can you can really just cover water and catch fish. And then sometimes you can slow down and catch fish. Like uh, the last tournament I fished there, you, we really did slow down and I'll pick up on that a little bit later. So the learning curve for me, I would say, was that that watercolor difference and then having to understand when to move a spot and when to just give up on a location. There's a dock every 10 yards on that lake. That's mm -hmm. one thing you got to you got to overlook. talking to Matt McCluskey about that, about timing. Isn't that crazy? Oh, yeah. I just love right place right every now. time we do these. Yeah. It's whether it's, it's, it's Mr. Folk mm -hmm. um, or, or Matt. It's just mm -hmm. like it's so cool, like how this is all connected, right. and like there's always through lines and stuff. Yeah, that you right can place, pick right up time. On. Yeah, you guys are probably mostly going out of Parkway Marina. Uh, I mean, I'll launch anywhere on that lake. I've okay. launched all the way down in Pinhook. That's up the Blackwater side. Mm -hmm. Uh, you got uh, Oak Grove is up near the uh, the bridge that crosses right in the Roanoke, and then you got Pinhook in the state park mm -hmm. down lake near the uh, the mountain that I call it. Mm -hmm. So. You got, uh, I prefer launching at Pinhook or the state park. I just sure. love that down lake area. Mm. My, my favorite. It's my home. Hmm. Going, getting to this big school. And I remember, and I've, I've, I've bored Jared to death with this story and the audience where our first, our first tournament, we knew nothing about this. No one in my family fishes, but me and my brother, none of them are outdoors people. Uh, we had no help with any of this and we show up at the first tournament and there's Penn state and tech and they're all in fantastic uniforms their boats are all wrapped 
And we learned that we needed a uniform and a pin. And we're like, well, shit. And we ran to Walmart to get two blue shirts and the biggest Sharpie. And we put just S and U for the first tournament. And it was nerve wracking that first tournament until we we're like, oh yeah. Like, and I think we cracked the top, there was a top 15, top 10 anyway. But the point was like, up until we launched and by the end of the day, we thought like we, this is out of our league mm -hmm. because going from where we are, Grant, we had a decent boat and everything, but then you going from Northern Virginia to tech and then you have a tracker and I'm assuming everyone else has different boats. And let's just be honest about the way it is. Hey, you are fishing out of a tracker. Immensely though, getting into that, how did you feel about that? And how did you make it a positive, take those negative thoughts out there? Cause maybe Jim has, you know, I don't know, a, a brand new Ranger with 50 you know electronics on it and you have this aluminum boat that you're fishing out of and you've done extremely well you're a fantastic angler but mentally did you ever have those voices in the back of your head t like that were getting on your nerves about that stuff no no uh i don't know for other people but uh, the way i look at it is uh makes me feel better when i catch them mm. i don't know you see these john boat guys like you said matt mm. mccluskey yeah he's got the graphs on there but mm -hmm. he's doing work out of a 14 footer mm. i'm going up against 21 footers in these college events in a 17 18 foot aluminum boat and no no forward facing sonar and mm -hmm. when you crack 22 and a half pounds you, that's awesome you put a smile on your face that's and you right. go it proves to to yourself that you can make it no matter what the circumstances amen it's not about the boat it's amen. not about yep. the boat it's about the fishermen it's mm -hmm. about the mindset you come into each day with um and it's always about catching that next fish and that's mm -hmm. like one of my biggest things is like it's always about putting one more in the live well mindset mm -hmm. mindset mindset mindset's huge Great positive Same, attitude. positive Positive mental attitude. I, I learned that through uh through kicking actually. <laughs> really? <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, if you, if you miss a shot, man, and you miss one of those, it's the same thing as missing a hook set, you know, or jumping a fish off. Mm -hmm. You get that same feeling of I could have done something different. You just gotta look to the next. Mm -hmm. So would you rather like have to be the quarterback or have to be the guy that makes the kick to win the game at the end? Like which has more pressure, you think? I'm, I don't see that many quarterbacks getting their getting uh, put on shoulders, you know. So I, I like I like <laughs> hitting that answer. I like hitting that kick, man. I well, did I, it. And I got to think, <clears throat> being a kicker, because you're right. Like going out there to win the game, you know, is or potentially lose it if you don't kick it. Like you've got, I imagine you got to have clear hair headspace. You cannot oh my be God. thinking. You cannot be thinking I'm going to miss this or I don't want to miss this. Everything mm -hmm. is like you want to be in that position. Get me out there, coach, so I can put it through the uprights so and we can win this. I think you're. I would think. Mm -hmm. If you have any success kicking, you you're you're operating from a, a again positive mental attitude. You have a steel mind. I uh, that. I, I say I do, and I think I do. But yeah, uh, I I'm that I'm that type of kid that you want to put me in the tournament. Like right. I want to go fish these events. That's right. Any event I get the opportunity to, mm -hmm. even if I've never fished a place before, I'll walk in there and be like, yeah, we'll catch fish tomorrow. We'll be good. That's right. That's, and that's I awesome. love it. I love doing it. So how do they, if, if you had 40, let's say, or the 80, 40, how do they determine with, uh, who goes and fishes? All right. So with our, with college fishing in general, um, it's kind of, you got a boat, you can fish, gotcha. right? So our, our team is if you have a boat and you want to fish, you're more than welcome to fish. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no requirements besides having a Jersey, like he said, and gotcha. paying your dues. Um, so we have, set, we used to have like 10 boats. Now we're down to like seven, mm -hmm. six or seven. And, uh, you just hopefully find a partner that has a boat or gotcha. you have a boat and, uh, you just get a fish, you pay your entry gotcha, fees. Okay. We'll cover hotels. Um, we'll cover fishing license. Sometimes our team, we're getting boats wrapped this year. So that's oh, wow. exciting. That's so really cool. two, two or three boats are getting wrapped this year for the squad. And, uh, you just got to go fish them. It's, it's that simple. We uh, at Virginia Tech have a very inclusive way of doing it. We, we allow for any event that we hold that doesn't require a buy-in, that it's random selection, so you get to fish with as many people. Hmm. Um, so if we say we're putting money on a tournament, okay. like we are holding uh, a fundraiser tournament coming up August 22nd. It's still tentative, but um, for that event, it's open to alumni. It's open to everyone. Um, alumni do get discounts for Virginia Tech alumni but it's open to anyone that's willing to fish Smith mountain Lake in August. You got to be a strong human to do it, but, uh, uh, it'll fish good. It always does, mm -hmm. but you just got to show up and fish. And that's mm -hmm. the same style that, uh, our team runs. So mm -hmm. what I respect too, about from what I've heard from heard you say, and I've heard you say in college too, it's not like you're a big, you know, football program where they're giving you everything. Uh, you're actually going out and working, uh, hard to earn, 
uh, that opportunity to go mm-hmm. out and fish uh, from like you're talking about the boats, the fees, the hotel travel expenses, all these things uh, is on you, on your shoulders. And you guys are all self-run. In other words, you talk about fundraiser tournaments, you're raising the funds. You're, you're everything you do, you do because of you, not because mm-hmm. they're writing a check for you. And I, that to me, and that, and, and that goes to the fishing industry too. These guys are at the end of a tournament, even the pros are getting in a truck and they're driving their boat to the next thing. Mm-hmm. They're not getting on a plane. They're not sleeping in hotels. They're, you know. Motels. 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 They're, motels. they're never exactly. pretty. They're not, yeah. They're never pretty. No. So it's, it's a, that's just another reason why I love the fishing industry because they're just really down to earth people that are doing every, this. Every one of those hard. guys on our team wants it. Right. Uh, I, I know there's a couple kids there now that are putting in some effort and it's running a business. Mm-hmm. I mean, doing the same thing you're doing here, yeah. running a business, working, getting sponsorships. We're doing that. We're mm-hmm. selling merchandise. We're holding fundraiser mm-hmm. tournaments. We're doing the whole nine yards mm-hmm. just to be able to put guys in hotels yep. and get them as many. Like we said, we're finished second. Mm-hmm. That's due to us being able to house six boats at each tournament we've been to mm-hmm. so far this year. And that just helps us mm-hmm. immensely in the long run. So tell us about too the the uh, I want to jump, kind of jump into your the actual state tournament. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean you've talked about leading up to then you put yourself in a position and you're going to go out and fish your last last year and this is your last shot and so kind of maybe walk us through that that day that state tournament. And then we'll just so it goes what you qualify for state then regionals then nationals. Or no. How, so a, so just so we get. Uh, do a little backstory. So state championships held by Bass Nation. This okay. is for the BASS Carhartt College Championship that we qualify for. It's first place takes it and they get a qualifying spot. Each state has one if they have a Bass Nation event that holds it. Like uh, we didn't have one last year, sadly, because it got canceled. Mm. Um, but say you can go to any state and qualify. It's first place gets to qualify. So we were lucky enough to finish first and grab that qualifying spot from Virginia um, to go there. So these events, they also, Bass also holds five or six um, qualifying events that are open. Um, Their first 200 some odd boats that register get in. And sadly, our team didn't get any Mm. in for some reason. I'll talk about that a little later, but uh, we we registered five boats trying to get in and not one of us got in. Mm. So little little uh little thing for Bass Nation if someone's listening to let some Virginia Tech boys in next year. So especially if you're like qual like this is something I think they could adjust too is if if you finish like say the top mm. twenty schools top ten sure. you should automatically be able to pick you know what terms you want to get into and reserve some spots because I think with the classic and AOI guy in Bass don't they automatically get a classic berth the next yeah, year right mm-hmm. out, so you you would three. think you would get some kind of preferential treatment if you do blank correct right. I don't know right. so. They uh, it's register first come first serve is what mm-hmm. they said. A lot of Auburn boys get in, a lot of Alabama mm-hmm. boys get in, Bethel, those states, and shocked. We <laughs> didn't we didn't pull we didn't pull one team out of the five that did it in the mm. first ten minutes. So I mean, we sit there, fill out the form like everybody else, and we get in. But this mm-hmm. year it didn't happen, sadly. Mm. Well, we can get into the politics because I love to get national yeah, stuff. Yeah. But uh, so going on to the state championship, yeah, right? state championship. Then All we right, get into so politics. you have to finish first to qualify for national championship, and uh, lucky enough we were. Uh, it's March nineteenth, I believe. So that's perfect time for Smith Mountain Lake. You're mm. going to see twenty plus pound bags come out of the the whole spring february to april you'll see those big bags wow. and uh we were going into the day zero practice me and my partner spence and uh we had no practice we we're just like you know what we're gonna go catch some fish we fished it that time last year um and uh they say don't fish history but uh we fished a little bit of history i will say and we it wasn't good history it was like all right we know they're in these trees and we pull up, and I mean, first couple minutes, we catch two dinks, absolute 12 inches. But I'm throwing a big mag draft, six inch bait, and uh, one of my favorite things to throw out there. And we just go throughout the day, and we only have like two keepers by noon. And I'm like, man, we got to make a change. And we we tried going deep. Uh, we tried staying shallow. I caught my first two fish in the morning in like two foot of water. And this is when the water temperature is barely 55 degrees max, mm. maybe even less. And, um, we're just like, this is a rough day, you know, and we're having a hard time and we pull up to the back of this little pocket and we, uh, I got on this little gig where I was taking that mag draft and I, I chucked in the middle of, middle of a Creek, uh, where trees came out too. And I just hook into a five pounder hmm. and that started it. I get 
we actually catch two fish at the same time. It was hilarious. He's throwing a uh, a jig, I think, or a Texas rig. Pitches a jig in. He sets the hook, and I set the hook. Maybe a two seconds apart wow. wow and he goes got one and i say i got one and i'm like mine's bigger drop your bleeping <laughs> fish said some bad words maybe uh because i was really amped it was huge for for having two fish in the live well that were 12 inches sure. and i get it in the net and it about pops off so i was like oh, oh my god wow so we're like we're happy we're like all right i'm not gonna drop this mag draft and uh i, I just go to the next point five minutes later perfect cast on this point tree on it with a little bit of clay bank really important that time of year i think and i have my reasons uh, i'll get to them hook hit it hit the clay bank three cranks in and i'm reeling the mag draft so you can barely see it i mean you got six foot visibility this time of year even in creeks so i'm really reeling it to where you can barely see it probably like four foot deep and i just watch a white mouth explode on it set the hook another five pounder this mm -hmm. is all in five minute time span wow. so we have two fives in the boat and two dinks roll around to the next pocket and we're just hopping point to pocket point to pocket mm -hmm. and they're all littered with trees and man the next pocket we get into send it right next to a tree and uh for any guy that follows bass nation during the classic i don't know who was throwing the mag draft but they're pitching it next to trees slowly reeling it out and they're just erupting out of it i did the same thing so we we're pitching it next to a tree giant fish comes out of it catch another five pounder Wow. And uh, this is, we got an hour left in the tournament now. We have three five pounders in the boat. Um, go five more yards, pitch in, catch a three and a half. So we're like, oh my goodness, we need one more fish. We know it, 20 pounds is going to win it. And we think we have like 19 in the bag. And we had this 12 incher that was just killing us. Yep. And man, oh man, we, we were right. Um, we pull up and I'm like, dude, just tie on the mag draft already and catch a five pounder to my buddy. And what's Spencer's last name? Francis. Francis. Yeah, Spence okay. yeah, Francis. Yep. And uh, man, huge shout out for tying on a mag draft, right. Francis. Yeah. Thank you. That's huge. Right. <laughs> Without him, I would not be sitting in this seat talking That's about cool. winning a state championship yeah. <laughs> because he ties it on. We hop in the boat. I hop in the driver's seat and we drive to the next point. We just we're just hopping cove to cove within this like quarter mile stretch that I know is just loaded mm. with fish. And rightfully so it is. And I'm catching one pounders here in between those five mm. pounders, but the, they're just back to back to back. We had two hours left in our tournament when we caught our first fish and uh, first big fish. Mm. And now we got 20 minutes left and he ties it on. We make the run, stop, first cast, that kid catches one. And I'm just like, you couldn't have done this earlier, man. Couldn't have done it early. So he just drops it right on top of a stump, right off a little clay bank point and just boom. I watch it. He doesn't see it. He's like, oh, I got one. It's small. Fish jumps right next to the boat. It's our biggest fish in our bag, almost six. Mm. And I'm just looking at this kid. I'm like, thank you. Wow. But the whole mindset of that day is every time we'd catch a fish, man, it was just one more fish because we knew it was going to take right. over 20 pounds right. to win it. And uh, we pull in and, I mean, Liberty boys come up and they, they got 20 pounds and get a little sweat happening now. And I'm just like grab our bag, put on the scale, 2279. Wow. And I was just smiling. I had never been happier because awesome. it, it took us two and a half hours to catch all those fish. Mm. And it was back to back to back. And it was the best day of fishing I've ever had. How many schools were? Uh, I don't know exactly. We had Liberty. Uh, I think Radford was there. Uh, don't know if JMU was. Mm -hmm. A bunch of Virginia Tech's teams i think we had seven that mm -hmm. tournament and there's also like i remember uh down there one time with the youth there were some junior colleges too that would compete oh yeah junior colleges can compute yeah colleges um and uh, man oh man uh, it was a tough competition because i mean mm -hmm. second place was 20 pounds one ounce wow. or two ounces so you're right that last six pounder that, that was it huge. it really solidified the bag and uh we came in and just we were blessing god because mm -hmm. it was one of those days that it all clicked mm -hmm. for us because we were struggling. I mean, we tried a bunch sure. of different things, but uh, I found out a bunch of things about that mag draft that I truly think are key players for me going forward on Smith Mountain Lake in the okay. spring. And uh, I'll give some of them away if you okay. want. Yeah, but before we do that, because the power of this not being live, why don't you grab a couple of mag drafts um, and we can quickly break because it's always good for, for Jake's bait and tackle. I don't know if we have any left because yeah. everyone sells them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> probably burn Six out of them. Six inch and a nine inch. Yeah, because yeah, uh, uh, that day they would have bit in the nine sure. as good as uh, the blue pearl. The pearl. So, I'll always <laughs> And the blue shad, I think it's called. I'm always like curious. Like, is the like mag that. draft 
And you can go grab, actually, if you could grab three more baits that you would throw at Smith Mountain Lake right now. For right Jake's. now. Yeah, just like, yeah. Like Got you're, it, because I haven't gone to the tournament where we fished uh, June 3rd. Because that tournament, we finished second in. Dude, grab a bunch of... I got you. I'll be right back. Bye. Have a good evening. What's that? It's just all of us. Oh, it is. It's, it's just, I was laughing. I'm never, it'll never get old. And it's never. It, it doesn't. There's never a shortage of. And it makes you a better fisherman. Like I can see, like how some of these guys, like they don't fish as much, but because they like talk to people nonstop about it, their minds are tethered. Like the Ricky Polk. Like yeah. Like, would you? Do you think you guys would have done what you did without that interview? No. Like, I mean, no, like, isn't that and crazy? I'm laughing thinking about like I same sort of thing. We spent when you were talking earlier. Go ahead. No, no, no. It was like we spent out of that entire lake. We spent the majority of two days. I'm talking over three quarters of our time in one little cove that he told us about. Less than less than a mile. Less than a mile. One cove down from where we launched. It's just. It's, I mean, nuts. We had fished, um, we had a second and a third, no, a third and a fourth. Third and fourth or second and third? Third and a fourth down at Smith, uh, our last tournament. When was that? Um, gosh, what are we in now? June, so it was probably May. Um, and we went out of Oak Grove. Yep. Which we had never fished that far up. I had a little bit, most of our time had been down lake and um ricky folk that guy he was telling us he said well this little cove right here and like i said it's the one cove over from the thing and we rolled in there and we, i bet we spent three quarters of two days just depends there just, man you can you can I mean, and we didn't have absolutely find them what did we have i think we might have had 14 or 16 pounds it wasn't like great bags oh, but no. it was, i mean i got a i got a good story about the next tournament mm -hmm. that i that i fished the mlf one that we just yeah. finished seventh and second in yeah. that one was pretty yeah. cool and unique and, and that is such a beautiful lake <sighs> we're gonna try vacation there next year we got oh, i got the the four special right here so that's hilarious what i'm laughing at right now so mccluskey had the mag draft mccluskey yeah. had this, this well, it's pretty versatile floater. yeah it, I mean, it is it, everybody this one it's hit or miss on smith you really got to find a mite biting it Right. I don't. What did he talk about the Akaquan and yeah. that stuff? Rose, yeah, yeah. yeah. This rose fish rose. is a little different. You're yeah. you're throwing that on docks. Yeah. You're not. Uh, I mean, I could have grabbed like 20 baits, but I. Yeah, no, this no, is no, the no. one I wanted on. Well, right. got second, and then the drop shot and the the spark shad, gotcha. the the three point, the three inch spark shad. That's cool. There's another, like one or two other things, but. And just talk about yeah. those and, and the thing back to like this too talking about all the different water and just how many people still and that's what i love too about like our club like we take people and, and i was the same way get involved in that and I, then i fished the chick fell in love with the chick like i'd fished smith mountain before but there's people in our club that had never fished went down there and fished it and again fell in love with it couldn't wait to take their family back and their wife back and like then yeah. it becomes one of their favorite you know so it's like it's almost like that experience too it's, like you're sharing in that you're, you're a pathway to get them, show them these things, and then they fall in love with it. And it's like I said, it's the best fishery in oh, Virginia, yeah. hands it's down. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah, um, it's amazing. We talking about the res? We talking about Smith? Oh, Smith. the res Smith. is second to Smith. Smith, okay, yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, I don't know. The, I like the res. I've had quality success on the res. I've seen quality success, but uh, I know more ten pounders coming out of Smith. 
than the res. I think it was Cruz that also said it too. If they, if Hydrilla ever got into Smith, mm. it'd be the best fishery in the world. Mm. It would literally be better than Gutter's. Oh my well. gosh, yes. I mean, could oh, you imagine that? Water would be, would be even cleaner. Oh and my that's goodness. scary. Yeah. I mean, okay, so it's got everything. It's got everything it needs. Yeah. And it's so funny when you're talking about that, and yeah, I guess we're, we're still alive, whatever. I will yeah. edit it later. Um, but it's so crazy. Like Skeet Reese, Smith Mountain Lake, 2006. Mm -hmm. It was an Osprey at the time, was the big bait. And he was throwing that at it was a what? Oh, still works. It's the Osprey. The, sa yeah. the same same concept of that line through. I just prefer the mag draft just because it's a little easier and uh, you don't got to deal with the uh, the whole line through situation. I don't know. No, I 100 percent agree with that. And I think this fact is like, but the Osprey didn't catch as much in the sense of like from branding. So mm. I wonder how much of it is. Everyone's like discovering big swim baits, and it's so crazy because like I. I still throw I still throw ospreys and stuff, mm -hmm. but it's because like I was part of that Western swim bait culture. Mm. But it's like because the mag draft was so pop culture, that's why. So I wonder, mm. is it because the mag draft is so good, or is it because it was such a dynamite branding thing like the Ned Rig? So it was like, well, it's the mag draft. It's like, well, we had Bastrix and the Osprey too. It just didn't seem as to sizzle as much. And I don't know. I've always like I've always been curious how much of it is the branding of the Zaldane with it, and how much of it was just the bait. I don't know. Like I think it's a little it's bit of both. Combination of both. both. Yeah. I, yeah, I, both. I think it's both, honestly. Um, I found the mag draft to be a little bit more flimsy. I think the head wobbles just a little bit more mm -hmm. and i love the way it looks and i love their color scheme they have on it especially with how clear the fishery is on smith mountain lake that this white back shad is i think that's the name of it is just elite in its own category just because i mean you have the soft plastic it waddles you can reel it so slow and did you ever rolls. do you hear of the american trash fish little creeper no okay i'm gonna send you a couple right. uh so it's a california bait they actually took a um they took a shad and they actually put the dead carcass in a mold and then they mm. hit it with plastic the plastic is so soft it's the only bait besides a huddleston that can work in below freezing water the plastic is so flimsy mm -hmm. but I, I matt allen was talking about that back in california what's so cool about that is you can just slowly just just creep it and if it hits anything it'll shake because it's so mm. soft the problem with it is you can catch like two fish and then it's, it's done. Yeah. But it for a six inch bait it is so soft, it's insane. Mm. I'll send you a couple of it because like I, when I thought the mag draft, I was like you know this is reminds me a lot of the American trash fish, but it's almost um, I think I it's a little bit harder that. than the American trash fish. But the same thing, it's like you can creep it mm. almost like a Huddleston that that mm. bottom bumping thing as one mm. technique for it. Rem reminds anyway. me one more thing, um, you can skip it. Mm. Now I, I I've had sometimes with line throughs um, when when they hit the water sometimes get a little little yeah. tangled it's not the easiest but that thing you can skip it ten yards underneath of a dock now am I throwing it on docks every time no not one bit mm. so uh, I'll fill you in on a little bit about the uh, what we were doing though because it was pretty key stuff we were keying in on that tournament so it's March nineteenth water's really cold um, but you got to be confident with what you're throwing. And that's number one. I didn't drop the mag draft all day. We found the right water. That's what really keyed me into it. I caught fish on it right in the morning and then had a law because we changed locations. And we went back to that location, just fished different portions of it. And uh, like I was saying, they were on trees. So trees were a big factor, but it was trees with clay. So could have been a stump, could have been on a point, could have been in the back of a cove. As long as there was clay bank and a tree, it could have been a lay down. It didn't matter. The sun shade didn't matter. It just had to have a clay bank and had to have a tree. Do you think it's because it's warming up the water faster than clay bank? Or I do you think, think so. Shad? Watercolor. Watercolor. A little okay. different on those clay banks. It's not Smart. as clear as some of those rockier banks. And was that a history bite or was that because you were saying um, about before? I've caught them on the mag draft, not in the same coves. Yes. As far as wood the, and those, clay, is that something that you're used to or that you've done before? I've done the wood and clay out? before. Okay. I have uh, done it on a spinner bait. Gotcha. They wouldn't touch a spinner bait. Okay. Um, I think uh, there was not that much wind. Gotcha. And I've found success with the mag draft when there's no wind and wind. Yeah. Um, but hmm. those hokey bass boys, they know exactly which banks I'm talking about. And it's uh, they're 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 unique when they're on them. They're on them. Is it is it blueback herring? Because that is, seems like a yes. very blueback herring thing. Oh, it's to such me. a blueback herring bite. Okay. Um, it's all near deep water. Yeah, uh, that's, that's the whole lake, really. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you're going way up the Roanoke or way into the Blackwater section, or even Craddock. Craddock's that far right side, mm -hmm. um, down by the dam. But uh, when you're fishing that main lake stuff, these are these are like main lake pockets. I'd like to call them and main lake coves that aren't that huge. Is, yeah, okay. It's a huge thing on Smith Mountain Lake are these 
early spring, you can pull up. It could be a little depression in the bank on the main lake where it comes up to 20 foot in the middle of it, hmm. and they'll be there. Hmm. Um, or they'll be on those like main lake pockets that are like 100 to 200 yards deep, and that's it. They don't go back and they don't branch Not that much. That's a hundred percent. Yeah. And that's yeah. interesting. When you look at Smith Mountain on a map, it, that thing is like, as far as your fingers and your points and secondary points. And it's I intimidating. Mean, it's incredible mm. how much it can duplicate. But to your point, that's interesting too, is finding sometimes the subtle, the subtle one. Yeah, we, we fished, we fished really main lake points um, and nothing. Right. We're like, man, these are like rocky points with stumps mm -hmm. on them. We're like, dang, they're not here. We fished bluff walls thinking mm -hmm. that they could be pushed up mm -hmm. out of going to these pockets. We fished really shallow five foot, like mm -hmm. shallow flats with trees on them. Mm -hmm. We fished docks. Didn't have any success. But the minute we pulled in on some trees that okay. were a little deeper, a little closer to the main lake and they had that clay bank, gotcha. it was and that that answered my question of, as to whether you're that pattern, how long it took you to find that pattern, if that was something you went to right away, or just but to your point, you eliminated a lot of other Ooh, yeah. options and then finally came on to the pattern at work. Took us till noon, tournament was mm. till three. Wow. We had our first five pounder at noon. So mm. And what's interesting too though, you use the same bait. Like oh, you, the whole day. Through the whole that that's fascinating to me too. You didn't change baits. Mm -hmm. you, you you stayed with the same bait and changed location. That's it's it. it's Good. a bait I have confidence in. I call her uh, the Maggie. You know me me and the guys on the team. They all know it. They Maggie. all know I'm gonna have at least something in that size caliber tied on. Yeah. No matter the time of year. Yeah. It could be December and I'll have something that's just going 15 foot, 20 foot yeah. deep. But it's that size. That's right. So, yeah, so, so I'm going to just spitball here and yeah. just try to like try to and guys. So and you know if you guys are listening to the podcast, you know Spotify, Apple, switch over to the YouTube channel. You can actually look at what we're looking at here. But you can tell with with guys you haven't been there. This reminds me a lot about Lake Murray and Lake Kiwi down. That's because for some reason when we were doing college fishing, they only went there for national championships were blueback lakes. And so I'm saying like you're looking for saddles and stuff. So I'm assuming you're looking for these clay points that is just extremely deep going straight back and hitting the banks. So you went deep close to the shore is that kind of like what you're looking for that's generally? that's for for that springtime but yeah yes um what you don't realize is smith mountain lake they flooded the valley right mm -hmm. every bank will have a tree on it that's cut in half um anything past 60 foot of deep there's going to be a tree suspended coming up all the way to 25 foot sometimes hmm. so uh there's so much structure it can get a little bit overwhelming i will say um, and you have to sit down and take some time. Like if you catch a fish on one point, uh, you really got to look into what that point has and you will be able to re replicate that anywhere mm -hmm. on the lake. And that's one thing I believe, uh, mm -hmm. I tend to stay below the bridge on the Roanoke. I don't like going above it too much all the way down to the mountain. So you uh, like the clear dam. water. I you, love you probably water would love now. blueback lakes. Actually, you love the North Carolina. Oh man, South Carolina I, lakes. I wish I had some uh, some live scope on my boat because man, that, oh my god, I've heard of I've heard of guys getting on a really insane suspended bite there, mm. uh, just a little bit off the points mm. that you can't get on without it. But I mean, like I said, when I won that tournament that day, I don't think live scope would have mattered. I think it was just you had to be on the right bank to mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. where the fish were and where they were positioning. Because it didn't matter with the wind or the sun. It really just mattered with like location. Um, this was all within a quarter mile of each other. And it all had to deal with those those steeper banks. Not like drop-offs that are insane, but it's got to be near Main Lake. Got to have some trees on it. And it's got to have some clay. And uh, you can find a lot of that clay. Uh, I don't like touching docks, too, in the spring. I, don't, I, think, I think those bigger boys, they're chasing schools of shad oh, early yeah. spring. I, I think so too. I, I think honestly, and then guys, this is why when we did our map clinic, always have Google Earth and whether it's hummingbird or avionics up because uh, depending on your your Google Earth image, you can actually see some clay banks uh, with Google Earth, but you're not going to see that with avionics. I'll, I'll show you some examples of clay banks that I like um, a little bit to the right. Yeah, that thing, that blue really sticks out there. There we go. So if you want to go straight down from Parkway, um, and I'll just show you some example of clay banks that really stick out to me. Uh, so yeah, uh, go to the right a little bit. So you see that bank right like there? this one right here? Oh yeah. So you see how, if you zoom in, see some trees, mm -hmm. see some clay bank. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the type of quality I'm talking about. And those trees, mm -hmm. they are in about six foot of water at the tips at least. Hmm. 
And, and here's a fun fact, guys. Oh, wow. Always go 3D because you can see the strike and dip of the land to see how steep it is. So if you don't have this, if you hit 3D, you can see a lot of times topography a little bit better. So you can kind of get a vibe for how steep it is. That's impressive. So now if I want to show you an example of a non-clay bank that doesn't catch fish. Now, which or, side, i got to ask you a quick question. Yes, though. sir. On that island right there, are you fishing? I know like a lot of times wind, if wind's blowing you know cross that outside edge. On the outside edge i'm gonna be wind. on that outside edge to right. um i found it where the fish like to hug on the opposite side of the point that's getting hit by wind on smith mountain lake okay so, so, that was, that uh, so you're gonna be on the right side of that you're edge. on it right there okay I think interesting Jared, yeah, when you asked what my brother and I would do, it's like, this is the map study you're talking about, but it's like, you can't map study as much like the Potomac River, <laughs> but yeah. this is the places that you can actually yeah, do the depth, map yeah. study. Yeah. Um, I think this is the same place. So Ryan, you're uh, saying on that island to yep. the right there, there you're going to fish the right God, side. God, I, I hate not having a mouse. The non hold on, side. hold on. You're going to be down, actually. Right here? Nope, keep going. You're way off of it. Keep going. You see the island down there? Oh, there we go. Yeah. Okay. So, um... It's got that medium taper to it, but it had that clay bank and those trees. Now, didn't catch one of the five pounders on that bank, but I did catch a couple one pounders. Mm -hmm. So if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. um, I don't want to give away like the exact no, location. No. Of so course. I'm not gonna but let him give it away. Stuff. I'm not gonna let him give it away. So I'll just so you guys can yell at me. So basically, you can see this. How you this is what they call apparently in South Carolina like a saddle. So you have deep water on either side of this, and so if you actually took away all the water and you looked at this this is the kill point where you can have bait that move back and forth and when they come across this thing that creates the ambush point mm -hmm. so fish and then you throw a, a stump or in like hartwell they have a lot of bamboo that mm -hmm. comes right up the fish can position there and then as the bait comes across that's their kill zone mm -hmm. and so there's something about blueback and clay though but yeah so it's it's a slow this looks like it's more of a slow tapering point mm -hmm. right here a little bit more but it depends on the time of year. So like when the, the blueback will spawn spawn, which is later, they're going to go with more of that slow tapering so they can get up mm -hmm. super shallow and spawn. Exactly. But the deep stuff will also like, you know, play early spring. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that exact bank right there in uh, June, June 2nd, June 3rd, actually, our last tournament had about, I don't know, every couple yards, just, just blowing, yeah. blowing up, just bait everywhere. And uh, we hit that one during practice, and I mean, the striper were on them, but we actually couldn't find any bass, and I, I do believe that's because the bass were not there holding that time of year. Mm -hmm. We found our bass a little different that tournament. What is your vibe about, if you have striper and bass mixed in, do you stay or do you leave? Like, if you start catching striper in that area, do you, like, I'm bouncing, or do you try to work through them? I, I tend to find that it does hurt a little bit on Smith Mountain Lake. I've had times where I'll pull up on a bank and only catch striper, right? Um, I'll just leave. Okay. I love catching striper. Now, if this is just fun fishing, I'll stay there all day, mm -hmm. and I will catch so many striper that I my hands hurt. But I haven't caught that many bass integrated with striper on Smith Mountain Lake. I hmm. really haven't. Um, if I do, it's going to be like three, four, five pounds usually if they're sitting on that same stuff. You never catch any dinks near stripers. It's the one thing I have found. Like no dinks, and that's just on me. I also find a lot of those. They have like I don't know if it's white perch or white bass there. Okay, yeah, yeah. But man, you can if you get on a striper bite, it's most likely because those guys are around too. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. That's that's really cool. Because yeah. like yeah, that's something to know. Like like I know because like everyone has their own like opinions about that. I've heard mm -hmm. some people like when they catch striper, they leave. Others like they try to work through it, get mm -hmm. a heavier bait, get down underneath them. Because mm -hmm. I've heard that too, where it's like. If you catch a bass around striper, it's going to be a tank. You don't take yeah. them out of the live well, but you got it. Like there's not a lot of them. No. So that, that is really, really interesting. Um, so I love this stuff. I'll show you, I'll show you like another example of a, like a good bank. Um, if you want to go up a little bit, I'll keep You'll going. Go main road. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. So go keep going up right around there. Yeah. So when we're talking about these secondary pockets and stuff, you see, uh, it's clown point on the left uh it's oh that God. small I one hate not having a mouse all right hold on we're gonna get there you're good it's hard to find them you're a little high right through right in here oh that's the s turn no yes, that's not down. the s turns yeah you're down a little bit Go Keep up. going down down got it yes sir right there right where your mouse is yeah so you see that little pocket i'm talking about right here yeah, yeah. that's some of those types of banks that uh early march early february uh, they'll pull into those hmm. and uh i've heard 30 pound bags getting pulled out of the, something like that. Wow. And uh, so guys, if you want to see like why, like, so it, you have an exact, you got a bluff wall here. So if you're in the wintertime pattern, you want steep banks, generally speaking, 
connected to shallow water so they can move very quickly and they can change water depths but then if you're going from the spawn and then you know stop me if i'm wrong here this is the easiest way that they can go from winter to spawning without mm -hmm. moving very much at all plus bait can move in there very easily and so blueback will move into the back of the guts i don't know if this is a full blueback lake i'm just going based on what i know about blueback is they're going to move back into those guts um early in the morning and stuff mm -hmm. and that's where you can see like um casey ashley won with an underspin at like mm -hmm. hartwell because he was fishing these these gut bluff pockets like mm -hmm. that too. Mm -hmm. That that's that's textbook right in there. That's so cool. So the the difference with uh, this lake and said Hartwell and stuff, it's got threadfin, it's got blueback. Not many spotted bass. I've mm. heard of like somebody saying they've caught a spot there. I don't believe it's a spot. I think they just don't know what they're classifying their fish yeah. at because I've never caught a spot there. Um, but the difference is the spots. Those spots really love to suspend. These largemouth do now too, and the smallmouth do, but not as much as you think. Hmm. Yeah, that's so, good then. I guess yeah. that, that's really good. The, I mean, I kids that caught that twenty pound bag during that state championship tournament, they they caught them all suspending in about ten minutes. Wow. Yeah. So they they had a really good day, and that they were suspended. I don't know the depth. I didn't get much information on that, but that same day we were able to catch them five foot deep. That's so, crazy. It just tells you the dynamic of the lake. Um, those those little pockets that I'm talking about. That's the first place a shad will move in mm -hmm. the spring. That's why they're there, I think. Uh, I agree. They're just the first place. They'll sit right in the center of those. They'll get on the tips of those docks that are right on those points or right on the inside cut of that point and stuff. And you just slow roll a mag draft through there, and that's the first place they're going to be. Uh, that's that's my knowledge of that. The throwing the mag draft is stuff like that on Smith Mountain Lake. Is your mag is the mag draft your primary source or search tool at that time of year, or will you also keep them honest with a jerk bait or an underspin or something like uh, that that the jerk bait bite is great there i don't like throwing an underspin um i'll actually switch to if i'm going to compare something to an underspin i'll throw just a spark shad or like a 3.8 inch uh kai tech on like a quarter or a three quarter out a quarter or three eighths ounce head personal preference or is something different with the flash like, like going mm, with no flash versus I have, flash. i have no clue unpainted head ghost shad color that like clean clear grayish color similar to the mag draft the that blue bluish hue to it mm -hmm. that's all i'm throwing gotcha 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 and i just i like i think it's more subtle no flash um now if you got a day when it's really windy you can pick up a spinner bait a heavy one too especially and get it down a couple feet and they'll hit that really well okay but uh usually it's going to be like a swim bait of some type just because they are really keen and on shad that time of year um the swim bait the mag draft or the spinner bait that's like my three search baits there you ever throw a spy bait or you put a prop on the front of that thing so i the okashira heads yeah yeah, yeah i throw an okashira head i love those when i'm fishing docks because it slows down the bait just a little bit more okay so when you throw an okashira head on said like a, a 2.8 inch kai tech or something it really slows it down okay. and uh, those, yeah those are and i tell you another thing that i mean not just to retrieve here those going through the water column you can get bit a lot of times of it just falling just let it free fall mm -hmm. and as it's going that tail and then that little spinner prop and you can get a lot of, so a jig technique too so i mean you can do mm -hmm. your, let it get down slow roll it but even i found a jig kind of technique is dynamite with those especially cold water mm -hmm. really oh. any time of year no oh, any oh, any time of year yeah so uh, that's really interesting yeah Huh. Yeah, no, I, I just, I love, I love this part of it. I really do. Um, cause how do you distinguish? Like, so take that pocket, let's say, Okay. is there anything? Cause again, there's li literally 5,000 of those on the, on this lake. Is there anything else that, um, you know, whether it's on the outside bank or is there sun, the wind? I mean, is there anything, how do you, uh, determine which of those you want to go in? So let's say I'm willing, I'm going to go attack that pocket in general. Um, I'm going to look at that. to duplicate it. Yeah. Say. Well, yeah. So say I'm looking at a map and I'm pre-tournament. I notice that point comes out on the left side just a little mm -hmm. bit more than it does on the right. Mm -hmm. um, so the left dock mm -hmm. is going to really interest me mm -hmm. earlier in the year just because it's going to be deeper. It's going to be closer to the main lake. Mm -hmm. I really like that. Um, as uh, the weather heats up, I'll work my way farther into those pockets. And sometimes I'll try to hit every dock all the way into the very back okay. um said with that mag draft just skipping it next to the pylons and mm -hmm. stuff like that um gotta have a drop shot tied on mm, when it gets yeah. a little later in the year but uh sun doesn't really matter that time of year they don't like shade as much i think they like the sun a little bit better just because the shad are a little mm -hmm. trying to warm up 
So I don't try to fish the shade as much. So like with that bank, that dock, I'll fish the outside edges. The bass will sit right on those corners. They won't get really up mm. underneath of them like they do in the summer. That's a good point. So like if you think about a bass, mm. say come July, it's going to be in the center of that dock mm. or at the very tip Correct. in 15 foot of water where it's the deepest. Correct. Now the bass in March, they're going to be on those outside posts all the way close to the bank. That, that's really good, Ryan, because, again, mm -hmm. a lot of people, like, there's no doubt you can catch, catch fish on docks, but to your point, those areas, even between the docks, you know, can some, especially if you have a tree oh, or yeah. there's a rock bank on there, especially the smallmouth, I mean, those are areas not to rule out. I mean, yeah. some guys are going to go dock to dock, and they're just going to blow to the next dock. But to your point, Ryan, those those are areas you want to, to fish. Yeah. 100%. So anything that, like, if you catch one, think about it, like you just said, on a dock, four mm -hmm. foot, off the bank that's mm -hmm. probably four feet deep on Smith Mountain Lake. Right. Yeah, if there's a piece of wood in four foot mm -hmm. deep in between a dock, mm -hmm. there's probably a fish on it. Correct. A hundred percent of the mm -hmm. time. There's mm -hmm. probably gonna be a fish on it. Just mm -hmm. because it's in that same depth, it's got structure, mm -hmm. it's got an ambush point, like you said. Mm -hmm. And um going to that tournament, man, that six foot range was our happy number mm -hmm. we found that day. And anything six foot deep, we weren't fishing docks, mm -hmm. but stump lay down mm -hmm. uh just had to be on that clay bank but anything within that realm mm -hmm. had a fish on it yeah yeah and if it doesn't we found too uh just re recycling back through that and coming oh, back through with something I'll, else oh, yeah. i'll get to recycling I about mean, the next tournament that our success it was amazing and I, I still talk i threw two different things in just like you're talking about kind of off the dock nothing went back through came back through and caught a decent smallmouth and I, I, I had already fished that. So it wasn't whether that fish moved in, didn't bite, you know, or it's moving. I don't know. But just just because you didn't catch it on the first pass doesn't mean you're not. Mm -hmm. Especially yeah. when you see them firing them, too. Firing up. I mean, it's just like, man, they're here. You know they're here. Well, especially you know? if they're schooling or something yeah. like that. Like, yeah. And that's, they're eating, they're yeah. feeding or whatever. But uh, anyway, it's interesting. Fascinating. Oh, yeah. No, and, and, and these lakes are definitely... It, it, <laughs> I, I can see where this would be challenging to people that are used to the Potomac or, or grassy northern style lakes because it is, it's different what you're looking for specifically. And then how you approach it with also the finesse and your approach mm -hmm. there because dirty shallow water like Chickahominy, James River, Potomac, you can get away with a lot. When you're there and you're in the gin clear water and stuff, the mm -hmm. fish feel you like mm -hmm. like it's clear and you got to hunt them in the sense of mm -hmm. you got to think like if there's one sticking between these docks, you can't just blast really close to it and then you flip mm -hmm. a jig or whatever. You got to really think about your presence mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. and making those longer casts. I do. I'm a big believer, like just like when you're fishing like the Florida Keys and the Flats. Mm -hmm. In these type of lakes, the longer the cast you can make, that. the higher probability that you're going to hook the bigger one. Mm -hmm. The dink will might be hit by the boat, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. But if you put distance between you and the bigger mm -hmm. one, it's it's not going to feel that big ranger boat or whatever mm -hmm. pushing up against it. Right. But yeah, th that's my hypothesis, though. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with that, especially I, clear water. I would agree. Mm -hmm. so, I would 100 percent agree. So with 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 this with this fantastic tournament success, I guess we should we go to the next one now or? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So then, like, you turn back around and you fish another tournament. Yeah. So talk a little bit about that. So uh, I get to fish the June 3rd Smith Mountain Lake tournament, and we were so excited for it because school's out. Mm -hmm. We got some time to practice, mm -hmm. and uh, we got some time to figure out some really cool stuff about this lake that I never get to fish, really, because right. when you get to think about it, I'm in school, right. and I'm out of school during the summer. So I get to fish Smith Mountain Lake very little past june gotcha. so like this is like just that time period where i really get to like enjoy learning a little bit new mm. and learning a little bit uh more about the lake because mm. you get to learn something every you time see, you go out yeah. um that tournament um really cool tournament we finished seventh out of i don't know 60 boats for the mlf series on smith mountain lake and we caught i don't know 14 14 on day one um and with this event we caught all of our fish in this transition period. I don't know if you've ever seen videos on Bassmaster where you got a guy sitting in the middle of a creek fishing something that doesn't look like it's anything. Like you're a gut. Like, like, and you're just like, what is this guy doing? Why is he sitting there? Mm -hmm. And man, oh man, we got lucky. We found one spot that uh, wasn't on avionics. And it's just tried and true looking at your graphs and finding something that's unique. And uh, we found this little hump, eight, eight foot of water at its shallowest give or take 
and it was just littered with rock and it wasn't on Navionics. So we knew mm. nobody was going to fish it. Mm. We knew this was going to be one of those spots that was going to be unique and lucky. Um, we caught one fish off of it in practice. No, we caught two back to back off of it in practice, let it alone, hit the next type of location, caught another. And we're like, this is amazing. Like we're finding these little humps that are kind of shallow, kind of to the point where you can see them on like, uh, on the maps and stuff. Like when you look at Google earth, you can see them. You can be like, that's just when the watercolor starts to change is when, you know, you, you got the right type of stuff had to have rock. And, uh, that tournament, all I had on was a, uh, a three eighths ounce, uh, owner ball head jig unpainted with a 3.8 inch Kai tech on it. And man, it was a day because it was a grind. I will say, but when you hooked one, it was just so much fun because you're fishing a little bit of nothing. And we were bombing long casts Spinning over top of, uh, no, not actually I throw that on 12 pound test on a, you don't mess around <laughs> on, on, oh, not on. Okay. Swim bait fishing like this. I found 12 pound test to be good. Cause like you're keeping bottom contact, but you use a heavier head so you can still reel it fast. Mm -hmm. That's, um, one thing I found that worked really well this time of year. Now in the spring, I got to really slow it down with that same bait. Um, but during this like transition period and into the summer, you slow roll that bad boy just a little swifter. That's why I wasn't using a quarter. I still could have gotten a quarter down to that eight foot range, but I'd be reeling it a little bit slower. I wanted that reaction bite still. Gotcha, gotcha. So what we were doing is we'd pull up. We had this, uh, actually, disregard everything. We had this morning bite, um, shad responding. So you got to hit that, right? And uh, first day, we call it one during the shad spawn. Just didn't hit it, didn't time it right. Um, shad spawn on docks, clay banks, and uh, they like floating docks. That's what I mean when I say docks. They don't like pillars as much. Mm. They love floating docks. They do floating docks there. Well, so those, you talk about that. Yeah. So those, uh, those jet ski docks, those are the ones to look for. They love them. There, those white porous jet ski dots. And I've always been curious. Okay, sorry. Cause no, you're fine. Keep. No, yeah, my, 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 I go. I have this Aaron Martin brain. I wonder if floating docks work here more because there's not a lot of floating docks. Because when you go down south and there's all floating docks, I just have always wondered is it always the uniqueness that stands out? But but here's the thing, and, and the reason I'm saying this because Ricky Falk was talking yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah. He likes Smith Mountain too, mm -hmm. and he said that, and I'm like, you know, because nobody likes fishing those. And I even like, or if you get down a curve or something, like, oh, you can't fish docks because. You, because what we think is you can't get back under them. Mm -hmm. you can't, but no, if you're a fish, it goes back to the same thing. That dock is that thing. They've got that much water. That fish is it's a perfect place for the fish to be under there, still gets the shade, still gets the ambush. So just because you can't get back under there, like a traditional dock, doesn't mean you don't flip it by and let it sink and bring it along the side of it. They're going to ambush. I mean, it is, but I've never thought of it that way. I was the same mm -hmm. way. I'm not going to fish that. I'm going to fish the big, big dock with pillars and stuff. So you're the second one that said that. But we tried it, and to your point, it did work, and it's it's a new thing for me that like I'm not gonna. Whereas before, I passed over that, but no, to your point, like fish it, mm -hmm. they're under there. Oh, no, yeah, fish, potentially be under hundred percent chatterbait, uh, swim jig, or long, even this kai tech man, this kai tech yeah. uh, going into the second day that we got a fish, just pitched it right next to a little mm -hmm. dock, last yep. minute, last minute thing, set the hook, two pounder, yep. just like solidifying the deal glide bait. and another thing i realized oh don't get me started on <laughs> big baits man i love throwing a glide out there too but another that's goodness. little technique that i found at work too is is it, as a back motor like when you flip it out along, like you can work the edge but go ahead and mm -hmm. flip it out too once it sinks you can now bring it across this angle mm -hmm. too angles, Genius. angles 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 yeah so, yeah like and i never but i never I'm 47 years old and i'm not a great fisherman but I'm, i've never thought about it that way because like i say it's like well, you can't skip that so i can't fish it no no you, another thing to consider you think of it as a flat bottom yes they're mm -hmm. not they, Correct. they aren't they're none of them have flat there's troughs in them that's right um, that help them float and uh, if you can get it next to one of those troughs, that's yep. where the fish is going to be. Yep. They're going to be probably, tucked up and in it. Exactly. And there's, it's dark. There's algae growing up under it's there. It's not you got the dock. The it's what's fish, around the dock. It's something it about the dock. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Bluegill are swimming around. Yep. Thrift talks about that because he's at, he's at Lake Norman, which has more docks mm. than yes, Smith and Lake right. combined. And he doesn't fish them. He just mm. scans. He like He's like, you just sit there on your side imaging and you're looking for the mm. thing within the dock. It's almost like a yeah, like a right. dream within a dream sequence. It's like, I think you're completely correct about that. The floating docks, like you can see 10,000 docks. Mm -hmm. and you know you can always say the first dock last dock or whatever but it's like what's underneath there what's That's the topography right. change is there a tree is there a bush do you see bait in life you know and knowing just like what we're saying 95 percent of the people are not going to fish it for what we just said because mm -hmm. i never fished it before either until 
Ricky changed my way of thinking on it. Like, well, wait a minute. No, I can fish this. Good, a good uh, rule of thumb. If those shad are spawning early in the morning on this and there's a bass probably going to be eating them, there's definitely one. But that same dock come noon has that bass there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And they, they may not leave that dock mm-hmm. all day. If there was shad, if there's a little bank mm-hmm. that shad were spawning on, floating dock, the shad will mm-hmm. be underneath the dock in general, but the bass will be there too. That's right. Mm-hmm. So if you can piece that together and be like, shad spawned here in the morning, I got to re-hit that dock because there's mm-hmm. probably a fish there mm-hmm. getting ready to ambush again mm-hmm. going into the next day. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's a good thing Recycling water is just so important. And I think, I think it really is balancing the run and gun style with double checking places. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think this is also where like Tidal Potomac people can also be, this is a strength to you guys because you understand sitting and waiting for things to get right versus if you are growing up on a TVA system where you're going to run 700 points, mm-hmm. like you can blend both of them together and make a really cool superpower that mm-hmm. you could have. Cause yeah, like understanding like this is my juice. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I, I think BTL said the spoken hub thing, but like figure out an area that's going to be your main area and branch out multiple patterns in that area. Don't right. try to like fish the whole lake. Right. No, that's you know, right. that's exactly right. So going this June tournament, you're yes, doing going your into that June contact. tournament. You just gave me a great segue. We had <laughs> that one point, one hump that was our, hey, let's start here. Mm-hmm. Let's fish this. And work around that. Oh, area. we worked around it. There is like a couple in succession, these shoal points that are kind of replicating what we were going after these humps. And same thing. They had to be in that like six to eight foot range where you look at it as a transition point with rocks. It's that shoaly rock that you're looking for. And we start on the first one, catch two fish. Um one's like a four pounder um so we're, we're loving it i got two fish out of this spot uh go to the next spot it's really tiny next to this dock a little point you can't tell on on the same thing two two locations now that don't look like much on navionics second point it's that's huge yeah. and we find it each time we put up on that one point caught two fish on it every time mm. each one of them was a keeper never a short so we rotated four places the whole day and uh each time we showed up, each one of them had two fish on it. Hmm. Uh, it just depended. My partner, um, now I'm fishing with a different partner in the MLF events. I'm fishing with Dan Weber, a uh, good guy. And uh, he's thrown the drop shot. He's a master at it. He loves it. Um, and I just had the swim bait in hand. And we're just picking them apart piece by piece. I'm s- s- rolling it on the bottom. And uh, he decided to pick up the swim bait, catches a four pounder. So right now we're sitting pretty happy. Um, and we just roll back to the next point, re-hit it, right? And these guys have been watching us fishing these docks all day. Same thing happens. Pull up, next cast, two and pounder. We're like, all right, we got to hit something new. We only have, I think, 12 pounds in the live well because we have one of those uh, rabbit scales. We're like, man, we got we got to step it up. And the last 20 minutes, man, I was like, hey, let's pack up and let's leave. Let's go back down to the dam. We got some more points like this down there. And he said, no. We're fishing it. And I was like, all right, cool. Get up next to the dock, throw my swim bait right next to one of those jet ski uh, things. Two pounder comes out, strikes it, calls our one pounder we have in there. Bound Around the corner, another two pounder, like a one ounce call. Around the corner, three and a half. Mm. All on this one little stretch. Mm. And it's the same thing. Had to have rock. Was mm. a slight point, slight hump. And it was about eight foot deep. And man, we caught fish in 20 minutes and we were rushing back to the thing thinking we finally qualified mm-hmm. for another another national championship because there's two mm. so finishing seventh uh we qualified and when i said i went through probably three packs of kitex that day i did wow and we we're doing that same thing man where it was just slow rolling them on those rocky points and rocky humps that were about eight foot deep it was mm. insane one of those days where you're just like wow that was awesome because it was, we grinded for him, but it was unique, mm-hmm. something I'd never done. Was that wasn't say a history. Time of year for you, so wasn't yeah. a wasn't a history bite. Mm-hmm. Never fished any of those pockets that I mm-hmm. found him on. So it was something me and him were both new to, and we were mm-hmm. we kind of clicked over the next uh, two days, and we were like hmm. during practice, and we were just like we got this, we're good. So we showed up and we did it. And uh, how that tournament worked, uh, MLF style event, top ten qualify for national championship. Mm-hmm. So there's two That's nationals, good. and we. Uh, Luckily enough, finishing seventh, kept our team in the point lead for the Northern Division. So we're Virginia Tech's in first in the Northern Division and second overall. And by doing that, it solidified us for a day two MLF score tracker style hmm. event called the Wiley X College Shootout. So how that one works is it's a you get two teams that qualify from the top five schools. 
So me and Dan Weber and then my buddy Lynn Chitwood and Caden uh, go out there and we get a launch anytime in the morning before 630 because that's lines in. So we get uh, an iPad scale. Same thing you see these guys mm-hmm. doing on TV. We get a GoPro in the boat and uh, you get a you get a lines in at 630 lines out at 10 to 10 15 and then uh, lines out at one. So you get you get a little break in the middle of the day, and you get a live score tracker update. So we uh, pull up, and we're the first people to catch a three and a half pound smallie on a still on Smith. Oh, still on Smith. Okay. Same day, yeah, next was... day. Okay. Sorry. So you qualify gotcha. for the next day. It's like Got fishing it. day two, um, for the Wiley X shootout, and uh, you get a launch. We launched at six, and we're riding next to each other up to our spots. Cool thing about the event is you get to talk to your teammates. So I get to call my buddies. So I catch a three pounder on I a like spook. This. I just love. Yeah, I'm sorry. Like, I know people. I know there's a lot of people out there that just think Boyd Ducky at an MLF is just the devil. But there, I just, I, it's so neat the strategy yeah, with it's that. A whole different. Where, yeah, it's, score it, tracker. You suck yeah. today. You only got a pound. What are you gonna do? Yeah. It's like I. It just. I don't know. I think the, that's neat. The strategy and you got. Yeah. No, it's cool. It was amazing. Oh my goodness. Um. So we we catch a three pounder, three and a half pound smallie on a spook right on a point. We watched them blow up on shad for like. Oh because the shad spawn's happening and we finally figured out where it was happening by day four Mm. so we were sitting watching just smallies ambush shad on this bank we're just like come on and this is right near those humps that we were going to fish in the later part of the day so we knew like the fish that were going on the shad were moving to the humps in the afternoon and that's what we were doing and three pounder and i put it in plug it in and uh it gives you an update so my buddies get on the phone they call me they're like hey man you just did it nice stuff you're in first i'm like all right it's five minutes into the tournament yeah. Let it calm down <laughs> calm down and uh i mean we catch i don't know how many we missed so many on top water that day the 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 spook is amazing for those uh shad spawn but man do they just slap at it and miss mm-hmm. and they will hit it as hard as they can and send your bait three feet in the air and that's what's so great too about smith is a smallmouth well, mm. healthy smallmouth population strong small you know strong and smallies it's where they don't factor lake. more but I, I, you they, know. they don't because you can go and catch 23 pounds yeah. and and five yeah. pounders so right. it's it's a really yeah. hard thing because i mean i know 10 pounders coming out of that lake oh yeah and right. it's yeah. it's hard for a small mouth to compete in a lake that you can consistently Which, catch 20 yeah pounds and, and this is not like the northern where like you know the small mouth are as big as a large mouth because mm-hmm. i remember when kevin van oh, i don't know why i know all this stuff but like when kevin van dam went on smith and he was fishing targeting mm-hmm. small mouth but that shows you how much better the largemouth population has gotten since then right. to where you can't even compete with smallmouth anymore. Right. I think the introduction. The smallmouth guys. I mean, the smallmouth, they go out and just fun fish and catch smallmouth yeah. too. I mean, they're, they're just, they're fun to catch. They're a different breed. 100%. The, 100%. the introduction to those bluebacks made it harder to catch them, mm. I think. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, it's made the bass so much bigger. I, yeah, like blueback. I think people don't like it because it's so different. It's so like, you have to, and I think that's why Nolan Miner is also so good at it. Because if you know how to catch striper in the Chesapeake, you know mm-hmm. how to fish blueback because they're pelagic. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the way it was described to me when we went down to Lake Murray was you have fish that will just chill on a bush pile, and then you'll have fish that will constantly hunt the blueback. What you want to do is find a point where you can get the blueback bite and then you can catch the one or two fish that just live in the bush you can't live on the fish in the bush but you can Mm -hmm. fill out a limit Mm -hmm. and that's what you got to figure out and time it right and you need those spots to find it because like they will you could just sit there on those blueback lakes and then all of a sudden just chaos and you can catch 20 pounds and then they're gone and this was before panoptics and stuff where you could follow them but you're talking about a ton of bait and it's not like it's not like shad or gizzard shad because they're completely opposite. So if it's sunny out, the blueback are going to be on. They'll actually, they need the, the light. They need mm-hmm. clean water. Shad actually hate it. And that's mm-hmm. why there's always that early morning bite, generally speaking. Mm-hmm. A true blueback lake, you can throw a big saltwater plug in the middle of the ocean, basically, mm-hmm. and you'll get these insane bites. Because what happens is the, the bass on these big humps and stuff, they're pushing them up from 80 feet of water, pushing them to the surface. And so that's why you need these massive plugs is because those spots are looking up in 80 plus feet of water at that big plug. And that's why they use those big plugs. Not only because blueback can be 10 inches long, but you're trying to draw a fish that's 40 feet down looking straight up at this bait coming overhead like sharks. That's another, I think, I would imagine that's another sporadic right place, right time. Oh, yeah. It's not something you pattern, not something you can 
it's either there or not, and like you say, then all of a sudden it's gone. And like, you need to know the clay points. Like there, there are like so like Lake Murray. There's like six points that are like they're everyone knows about them, gotcha. but it's because like there are certain places that they're going to spawn, and then they have key wintering positions. Like every morning at Lake Murray, Lake Hartwell, you can set your watch. Like they're going to move back into the guts of creeks because yeah. they filter feed. And then they're going to push out and then start roaming. So that's that pattern, which I think you guys are hitting on. In the summertime, that's where you saw, if you guys want to Google it, it's really cool. The last FLW tournament, last uh, Forcewood Cup tournament, where everyone's just sitting there in the middle of the lake just waiting. Yeah. And then because they're fishing these bamboo stalks in 100 feet of water. And then all of a sudden, it's just explosion in the middle of the day. And they're firing these massive spooks and just reeling it as hard as they can. Yeah. It, it's, just, it's crazy because it's different. It's different, yeah. but blueback there can be so much blueback in a lake it can let you have so many fish like that's why lake hartwell lanier can have these insanely big spotted bass is because you have so much forage in there i think that's why lake anna also they don't talk about that but it's crazy that the blueback got bigger like they've got more blueback and all of a sudden lake anna is now popping because you have not only shad but you have such a diversity smorgasbord for these fish but i'll get off my my high horse about all that how do you finish this day (laughs) so uh we we kicked butt that day. We caught seventeen pounds that Whew, day. That's but crazy. so score tracker style, so that's out of eight fish. Um to first place caught twenty one pounds. We go into the day um leading off that first fish and we drop all the way down to like seventh place at one point. And uh come about thirty minutes to the end of the tournament, we hit a little flurry on a bank um so cool. that we re hit and uh catch three fish and push push us into first place by like two pounds a pound and a half i think so we're sitting in first with like 30 minutes to go all excited and we mean like like i said earlier that one fish man we just got to catch one more one more and uh good old radford team i think i don't know no i don't i don't know if it was radford or king college but uh those guys caught two fish right Mm. at the end and just snatched it from us psychologically though dealing with that I guess compare and contrast to different formats. I guess since you got, I haven't yes. fished them. Like compare and contrast them for us. Um, you fished a kayak tournament, right? You get to see those live weights, maybe, or you can, is it the you, same? It is kind of the same, but being in a kayak versus a boat, I'm not whipping my phone out as yeah. much because I want to go oh, and yeah. drink. So, I guess it's more intense, right? Because you 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 know immediately, well, right? Yeah. We we uh we caught a three pounder midday, and that pushed us all the way up into like second place at noon. So we knew we were doing all right. You know um, where you stand with. Mm-hmm. yeah to your point you're right you don't you, you don't know if anybody else is catching them what their weight is you don't know if your 17 pounds is going to hold up you know yeah. but yeah so it, it is was, definitely a different mental i, I will say it, it takes a lot out of you to uh not want to check it every 10 minutes mm. right because i mean i only checked when i caught a fish that's how i did it so whenever i caught a fish i had to plug it in so i check and going going into the day we were just happy to be there right and uh I will do that, and I will be hopefully one day on that Bass Pro Tour because that was the most fun fishing I've ever had. Seeing those live weights get put in and seeing your name say Virginia Tech, Ryan Fee, mm-hmm. and Dan Weber first place with 20 minutes to go, my heart had never pounded harder even for a game-winning kick in football. Wow. Um, I was just like, this is insane. And it's really cool because, I mean, you know you have to do better all day, Right. Uh, and it kind of goes on that point of like one more fish, one more fish, mm-hmm. one more fish. We were catching each fish, but it was tip for tent. This team would catch mm-hmm. one. We'd catch one. We'd see a bite window open up and five teams weigh in one fish. That's okay. That's so cool. So you actually get to see, cause we see it on TV, like the bite yeah. windows, whether it's Bassmaster, like, did you get to feel that too? Like, oh like- yeah. Well like early in the morning. So there's a shad bite. Didn't pop off as much as I would. We had one team catch like 10 pounds early. That's like landing three fish out there. Um, on those shad bite fish because they get pretty big usually those ones that are pushed up shallow so we see that but like come noon uh we we catch three fish and we weigh them all in and so did like four other teams at at like right around oh, wow. 11 to noon and we're just like okay and then right before the end of the day we caught three fish another team caught two and another team team caught two and they won it so it was like we just we caught our bite window and they caught their bite window but mm-hmm. they were just two pounds more than us oh, it, it that's, was exciting that's so um, cool. it also makes me wonder too if you didn't do that format it, it would, would the results be the same because you may not change anything the way you do it you know what i'm saying like it's kind of like whatever happened what, what are your thoughts on that first before i like start oh talking. it had <laughs> been a, it had been a different here, story but... uh because the fish they were weighing in they weren't as big as our fish uh, mm-hmm. yeah we were we caught eight fish for 17 pounds i think they were at like 10 or 12 fish for 21 God, pounds dude. barely and I mean, we had two, three, three pounders 
three three pounders that day. So like we had some quality in our bag that would have given us yeah. that would have given us a fifteen pound bag at yeah. least. I think I think the perfect format that would that everyone would agree on is the what they do at like fork. Like your best five, yeah. but you can weigh them and see the score tracker. I right. think would be perfect because mm-hmm. the thing I like about it the most is like a ab- big ability to make adjustments mm-hmm. to be like, mm-hmm. okay, I haven't, I'm behind. I'm in like dead last. Definitely I should probably stop. Yeah. Like, you know, or like everyone, no one's catching them. Okay. Now that I know that I should just grind out for a couple of bites mm-hmm. versus like swinging for the fence. Cause you know, you have those tournaments where it's like, I haven't gotten a bite. So I'm going to maybe lock a jig in my hand and mm-hmm. just swing for the fence. Mm-hmm. You get back and you're like, well shit, if I just threw a shaky head all day, I probably would have won the thing. Mm-hmm. And so it's, it, I, I like that idea of like knowing so you can strategize a little yeah, bit. There's more. a little bit different. Story. I don't know. The, my, my favorite, um, was the fact that we could call our teammates on the mm-hmm. other boat because there's right. two boats for Virginia Tech out there. Uh, sadly, our other team didn't perform as hot, um, and uh, they caught like six pounds Oof. for three fish, and it was a rough day for them. But I, I tried getting them on to our bite. Um, we were catching them on that drop shot and that swim bait and on those humps, like we said, and floating docks that were on the sides of bigger docks where the shade was, and I caught like two on two mm. on those in the afternoon and then the humps and uh they they just couldn't get on the same thing and we're like we get a call and be like hey man we just caught another three pounder doing the hump thing try finding and we sent them a waypoint so it was really unique being able to like communicate yeah. and that was honestly really fun because it's really reassuring getting your buddy to be like good stuff man yeah, good yeah, job yeah. plus it's a team sport now it's yeah. a real college like right. kind of like a team sport because that's the one the thing i didn't like about bass i'm sorry but it's like an FL, flw when it was FLW they did too it's like your team would win and then they'd split you up to fight each other and it's like mm-hmm. weird because it's like well you guys you, you you fought together as a squad for mm-hmm. so long it'd be kind of nice like if you're t- you get to have that more of that team right. mentality all the way right. through but i can go on a rant about that anyway um that's that's that's, that's freaking really, awesome yeah. that's so really what, cool what sets up now then for your uh national where are you going when is it so september 2nd through the 4th for the bass college national championship uh this is winya bay south carolina oh boy yeah um i don't (laughs) don't know if anybody knows about the place but uh fish is horribly good sometimes so like like one bag will be like 20 pounds one day and then six the next and it's a tidal basin type fishing not basin tidal river actually so it's not like the potomac river we got these big old flats it's really narrow you'll still get some of those flats in there a lot of lily pads some trees some cypress trees a little bit of docks lines up right up my alley for potomac the chick uh just that tidal, that moving water, I feel really comfortable in it mm-hmm. because, I mean, growing up all through high school, all summer, I get to fish that stuff. So summer tournament down there. So are you going to prep then on these? Like, say oh, yeah. A chick and a, I mean, a chick in a uh, Potomac before I mean, you go down there? I may. Or how many times are you going to so, try to get down there? Yeah, I I, uh, I may go down there. I got to look at the rules just to make mm-hmm. sure you know how that sure. works. But I think they close it off a month before or two mm-hmm. months before. So I still have a little bit of leeway on going mm-hmm. down to Winya. Mm-hmm. Uh, I may actually do that like next week mm-hmm. and uh, go down there. Check it out. Yeah, check it out. Do some bass mm-hmm. fishing. I mean, it's pretty summer right there. It's going to be late summer. Uh, keep going. Yeah, where's Charlestown? There it is. Um, it's going to be Georgetown, I think. That's right up here. Nope, down. Oh. Down. The Wait. Savannah. That's Georgia? This is Savannah. Charleston. This is Charleston right oh, here. So this is this is right here. This is Sandy Cooper. That's Sandy Cooper. So, then... so go up a, above it right there. Okay, this area Middle. here. There's Georgetown right there. Yes. So and then here we go right here. Cool. So we got them both up. So yeah. So basically, you're going to be going into the ocean probably if you're going to go fish the Cooper Basin. Cooper. <laughs> There's a canal. You see that canal you're on right now? That is it, pink is this line. Intercoastal waterway right here. Uh no, that pink line right there. Oh right here. here we go. Yeah, you ride that pink line for about a hundred miles. To Holy get to God. the Cooper River. Why are they doing this now when there's $10 gas prices? <laughs> mm-hmm, right? I- I'm not making the run. I, I think I've <laughs> kind of concluded that I'm not making the run. Uh, you got to fill up before you leave oh and God. when you get there. So you have to fill up twice. You get about four hours of fishing max out of an eight-hour fishing day. No. So, uh, I mean, I'm I'm used to making those long runs. Last year, we did the, the run down to Clayton up in New York when fishing the St. Lawrence. So I don't know if anybody knows, but you can get all the way down to the mouth of Lake Ontario. So you made that 70-mile run. In the tracker? Uh, no, no. Okay, I was okay, in a, I was in a 21 foot. Uh, no, I would not make the run in the tracker. No. Dude's got balls. I yeah. I don't know if it could go that far, yeah. man. <laughs> hey, I run, I run all the way intense. up. Yeah, I, I've run all the way up the uh, the Smith. I've done 20 miles in that tracker. Oh, my God. But yeah, it, it was takes like, a while. Lord. So, would you, so I want to 
talk about St. Lawrence too, but okay. So would you be your tracker in this thing, right? Then or? I'm not. I'm actually. We're looking for a boat sponsorship right now. Me and gotcha. my partner. So okay. we're looking for just. I want to start working with somebody because I, if I have to, I have a boat I can borrow. But I, I want to get on something where I can talk to some companies, do some. I just need it for a week. That's all I'm asking. So <laughs> we uh we have an 18 foot aluminum Ranger that we qualified in. That's what we fished out of this year. So it's uh, not the biggest boat, but it, I mean, it handles well on Smith Mountain Lake. But the issue we come into play here now is big water, a.k.a. 100 mile runs. I'm not making it. Mm-hmm. I know that just because that's, what, $400 a day? It's a lot. Give yeah. or take. You, know, you say you're, you're over half the day is been. Yeah, they got, so they got four fishing. hours of fishing when you go up yeah. the Cooper River. And uh, stressful, I would imagine. It fishes mm-hmm. way more like the Potomac and the Cooper River. Um, it opens <sighs> yeah. up a lot more we go down the up coop. there yeah but like honestly though like i don't know like how many people are title savvy now like again like i i feel like i'm a million years old because back when we did it like not as many people were as comfortable with title like i don't know who your competition is with this like i don't feel like you have to to worry about milk running it as much because no. i feel like you have an no. advantage because you understand title Correct. which is big well, he, you gotta like you said be patient earlier yeah. um it comes into play i think just understanding moving tides i mean sometimes it's as simple as throwing on what side of the pylon you throw oh on. god yeah oh my goodness yeah. i've seen that on potomac where it's like right side every time mm-hmm. because of the moving tide and it's just like sometimes that's a subtle thing that people just widely look over and but, catching retreads, like I'm sorry, like there's yeah. a reason Matter Woman and Lee Slovenia, you can still catch fish mm-hmm. always. It's because they they get restocked every right. weekend. So I got a I got a good tide example was uh, last year MLF college event. Uh, we were fishing Belmont Bay, you know, um, the creek that runs into Belmont Bay mm-hmm. on the right, where it separates, and you can still run full plane right there. A little deeper right there. Not that many people know it. Just scoops down right before you get into the creek channel. It gets a little deeper right there. This is mid June, and uh, all these boats are on top of the flat right near the island. And we're getting a moving tide. It's going high to low, and I know these fish are going to be on the outside edge because they already moved and positioned for it. And man, I walked in there. We got an hour and a half with the moving tide. Caught twenty fish. I watched five fish get caught in another person and other boats. And wow. there was 15, 20 boats out there. Mm. And just understanding, like if you find one of those little changes where it's mm-hmm. like, you know, the tide's going to move, you know, they're not going to be on top of the flat. I mean, we had the same grass really as that mix between hydrilla and eel. Mm. I think that's what you call it. And man, it was just, it was lights out that day when we caught them. And it was just because we were positioned. We we're the only boat near that, near the river channel. And that's where they were coming to. It's just, I mean, yeah, like the, the whole grass thing is so different than fishing like like the dock. Like, again, if you take a person that's only fished Smith Mountain Lake and you throw him on a grass flat in the Potomac, he's going to be like paranoid and claustrophobic. He's like, why are there, how, there's too many boats here? I got to be. It's like, you don't like, it's just a completely different world on how you fish that and how you mentally approach it. Um, I mean, we could talk about the Potomac all day, but I did want to talk about, uh, he has another passion. That yeah. I think and, we should talk about too. And on that note too, September two through four, uh, representing Virginia uh, in this link in the tournament. episode description. We're going to link that and all that information. But what I want to say too is if anybody out there wants to help this team, Ryan and his partner um, on that, how can they do that? Um, um, we'll, we'll, we'll start a GoFundMe. Mm-hmm. Usually that's what we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, gas prices being mm-hmm. so high. Mm-hmm. I mean, last year alone, it was a handful just to go up to New York. I'm I'm really looking forward to this uh, event. So we'll can you probably, find that like on the Virginia Tech page? Or, uh, or yeah. So have we have our Facebook page. We'll, we'll, we are we have our Facebook page. Mm-hmm. We use our Instagram a lot. Okay. So that's usually our driving force is our Instagram. Uh, we're gonna be starting back up our YouTube channel too. Okay. Uh, we're gonna be filming all of their tournaments coming up. So mm-hmm. that's exciting. And uh, we'll be posting that mm-hmm. onto all three that I just mm-hmm. said. So, so guys, help them out. And uh, for this tournament, also, like we were saying before, they, they do have a lot of good fundraiser tournaments, sometimes on Claytor Lake We do as Claytor well. Lake and Smith Mountain Lake. Those are mm-hmm. our two home lakes. Uh, August 20th, it's a tentative date right now, but alumni get a discount on entry fee. Okay. It's our fundraiser tournament. Uh, anyone's welcome to come and fish. Okay. Uh, get I don't... that to me, and we'll get that posted, too, mm-hmm. as well, on Jake's and... Uh, Cause yeah, I mean, the guys, as we were saying too, a lot of guys are fishing that a lot of clubs are fishing Smith mountain or, or even youth are looking for uh, it's a win-win cause you get to go out and fish and then you're also supporting a great organization. So, uh, you know, please 
help this young man out because it's will. like you say you think Virginia Tech remember you're thinking big you know big time football you know they're they're cutting them a check they're not the, we, these guys are doing it on their own so if you can help them out um that that would be awesome uh, yeah 100 so, percent. and yeah. then like thomas said back to uh yeah, you know back to our uh regularly scheduled program, program. <laughs> it's a little so, it's but like, so you're graduating and good, yeah, you know ryan good. was showing us uh before we started kind of what his he, he's got a gift um i was blown away by his um artistry if you will in uh, four brothers basketball. in a video yeah, we'll so just so maybe tell us a little bit about maybe what you're you're hoping to do here beyond college yeah so i uh i mean Ever since I started fishing, I had that idea that I always wanted to film, mm. uh, and I've made plenty of videos, and I got into videography at a young age to the point where I've come to really enjoy like the fine arts about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I made videos back when I was in high school about just all these little fishing trips that I used to do. It's uh, Four Brothers Thank Outdoors. You. And uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to be rebranding the name and stuff coming soon. Mm -hmm. But I love filming these documentary style videos. And uh, it's the one thing that going forward when I graduated, mm -hmm. um, I knew I wanted to at least give it a try while mm -hmm. I had the time. So uh, I filmed my first uh, documentary last year and uh, I, I absolutely love it. And uh, I've just got many more planned for the summer. Mm -hmm. I'm working on one for myself right now. It's a super difficult task, but we're we're doing mm -hmm. a, a trip to the uh, national championship, that road to the national championship. That's cool. We're going to do a little backstory on a little bit of everything, just uh, mm -hmm. what we college anglers go through, going to give you guys a little insight on all that. Yeah, and, that's uh, awesome. And, and so, guys, for everyone at home, if you're thinking like this is just like a Mr. Beast or a Logan Paul kind of video that he does, it, it's not. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to give you a sample real quick right here. Hopefully the audio translates, but I'll also put a link in the episode description to this because this is kind of what, what we're talking about. This is, this is more like some Martin Scorsese type yeah, shit. Really good quality. Yeah. Fantastic pacing, fantastic camera work. I like the, uh, you did some color corrections too, didn't you? Because the coloring is yeah. fantastic. Um, drone work too. No no one was killed by the drone work in this thing. It's 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 fantastic. In Waynesboro, Virginia, probably what, two hours, two and a half hours it's from about, where we're sitting It's right about now. two hours and two 20 hours. minutes right from here. Yeah. And and he's looking for work too. Oh, so yeah, he'll do weddings, and weddings, funerals, anything, like if it pays well. You can tell um, a story, <laughs> video. And, uh, and I think what you said though too, I was thinking, you know, the recent Bass Times, Ray Scott, you know, I was reading some articles about Johnny Morris and Johnny Morris said there wouldn't have been a bass pro shop without this man and what he did for bass fishing. Um, and even with everything they do and we're in it, like we're, we're into it. This is our passion. We know it. And there's a lot of people, young people that don't know what bass fishing is all about and like say what you all do. And so I think that, that kind of documentary of, uh, what you're getting ready to go do, I think is pretty cool. I only know, I haven't done it. I know because of what I've heard you tell and uh just being around it and so uh it's just it's really awesome um and gosh i just i'm glad you've come into the shop i'm glad we've met i'm glad you came in to share this stuff with us and share with others you did, know how you've had success. did we talk i don't know if it was off air or on air it's all blurred did you talk about how you got into this like the the just really the cinematography no, stuff i don't no, think dude. yeah so well, like yeah go I, again. I, uh, it, being a creative person runs in the family, I will say. My dad is one person that if there's an ambition, he has it. You know, he, he wants to do so much with his life. And I, I look at him as a role model. That's cool. And, uh, Did I you mean, want to shout him out? Or, yeah, or Pops. Yeah. I mean, the whole family in general, they uh, they have helped me so much awesome. getting my career going and putting me in the right direction. I mean, I'll outfish him any day of the week. I'll say that. <laughs> but uh, he, he taught me how to cast a rod and hold it. So that's all that matters. Uh, but he uh, really instilled instilled this uh passion for just arts in general that's awesome so uh i really love the videography side of things uh so he kind of was like pushing me like hey like i'll get you a camera here's a gopro so he got me my first camera a long time ago i think it was a hand-me-down and ever since i just fell in love with the uh the storytelling part of it mm -hmm. right uh my brothers i uh, don't know if any of you guys know this they sing country music and uh, they're releasing their album. Really? That's yeah. So freaking cool. So they sing, they, uh, they, they got a July 8th, they're playing the Walkersville Carnival in Maryland. So that's uh, right up 15. But they play country music in July 8th. They're dropping their first single. And uh, awesome. so ever, really cool. so they have their type of storytelling and they've been doing that since they were in high school. And I always was like admired that. 
and I love it. And I love the fact that they can get up on stage and do that, but I can't. So I found something else that I really like to do through my dad pushing me to do it. And my brother's kind of giving me an example. I figured that I like doing photography and videography. Um, my oldest brother, amazing with the camera. He can take a photo of anything and make it look good. So it kind of just like runs in the family, if I'd have to say. How, what, but what was that, I guess, moment? Like for me, I remember for fishing, it was casting kids. I did a casting kids competition. I won it and that's how it, it all got me hooked from there. When did you be like, I want to be the next like Noel, like Christopher Nolan? Like wh when did that, that sink into? Was there a moment you can remember like, oh, I want to do cinematography. I want to do camera work. Is there any moment you can remember? Um, not comes off the top of my head. No. Um, there is the moment I know the moment I wanted to be good at bass fishing in like that first tournament that I ever won. Mm -hmm. Uh, shout out to my friends, the, the potters, they hold this little thing called their Lake of the Lodge tournament. They own a little 10 acre lake and they get together every year and they hold a little tournament and we got to fish it. And, uh, first year I fished it, I won. And uh, I was back oh, in so high school. Cool. So, I mean, it's that's like really a neat. little yeah. tiny lake, but we all just well, get in pro did. 20. Yeah. It, in both situations, a kid's casting, I'm still fascinated by that kid. And then what you're talking about, it, it doesn't have to be big. What mm -hmm. it does, it, it, what it did, it, it created a spark oh, um, yeah. in in you. And and from that, look where you're at today. I mean, that's yeah. so cool. So I, uh, I always enjoyed making videos. And when you go down my page, you see some of the, the lesser quality mm. videos. But uh, I mean, a day I caught 27 pounds out of four bass out of a mm. kayak. That day alone, when I videoed that, mm. I was like, wow, the adrenaline mm. rush you get. Mm. Um, and I know it doesn't tell much of a story, that video, but that kind of like a little bit of a hooking factor. Sure. And now um, perfecting my skill over the past couple years in college, that last video, The South River, I just put out, one of my favorites um, just because it I'm really into fly fishing too. I'm into any type of fishing, hunting, all that. But uh, it was able to show somebody else and somebody else enjoying what they do. And right. that story aspect, I, uh, I can't write a poem. I can't sing that well. I can't write a song as perfect as anybody else. But when I get to put a couple things down and express somebody else's feelings about a place at that sets it apart for me, I would say. Gotta get, I'm telling you, you got to get. Mm -hmm. How old are you? I'm only 21, turning 20, 22. 21. 20, it's, that's your, yes. You got a natural talent and There's you can feel it there. and you're not thinking oh. it. And I think that's so important is to have that feel first mm -hmm. to be able to do something like that. I, I watched that video before we started and he I, was I crying, literally, guys. I literally Tears. got cold chills, like thinking, <laughs> man, yeah. like you, to be able to produce something that good, like and, and tell that mm -hmm. story, like that's, 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 you got a gift. It's only going to get better. That's, that's, that's the way right. I look it's at it. It's all up, up from here. That's yeah. right. So I, I have to go down this rabbit hole while I have you here. And then, and then we can probably, we can call it before everyone just passes out from exhaustion. What do you think the best starting kit is? Cause you know, I finally made the switch to Sony's. I love Sony's. I went the ZVRS because I just like, you could plug and play it for live streaming capabilities, but I want to upgrade to a six, 300 series, or even if I can afford it or find one because of the supply chains, I'd probably even upgrade more. But what, what, what do you think for something starting out? If you're starting out, what I have is amazing. So it's a mirrorless camera, uh, the Sony a6 300 and 500. Uh, they're not pushing the bank too much. I don't know the price exactly now. Uh, probably a little bit over a thousand dollars for yeah. the full kit, but I, I can record 4k video at 30 frames per second. Um, you can do full HD that's 1440, give or take, uh, at 120 frames per second. So that's ultra slow-mo. So when you see that's some so of these cool. shots, I can slow it down to the point where I see a water just drop and you can do that with these cameras while still shooting HD. Uh, I love that camera. Uh, you just need a little external mic. I use the, I think it's the Rode mini and, uh, all in all that camera I've had for three years now and it still holds up tried and true like i would tell anybody to get a sony anything from the a6 300 um that's a great starting camera honestly is the one i have i want to upgrade in the future it's just being in college you know how expenses go you can't spare two thousand three thousand dollars for a new camera every once in a while uh do you have an external battery pack on that oh yeah i do so so with with uh filming i found that you, your battery powered cameras you get a the mic on top also is powered by the camera. So you run out of battery a little faster. So I found that I buying like a 20, that's only like 20 or $30 that external really? pack. Yeah. Cause it's just the pack. You, huh. It doesn't come with the batteries. Okay. Gotcha. gotcha so gotcha. It, it, it takes, it just doubles your battery life, that pack. And uh, man, I, I, I get 
full day of fishing on it. I don't That's really, incredible. I'll go out there on the boat with my buddies and if we're filming anything or just taking photos, turn it on and uh, I'll get a majority of a day done before I even have to s consider switching a battery. And it, it's amazing. Guys, and then let me know in the comment section down below. And then also I'm gonna put a poll up on my channel. Would you like us to do a live stream where we just talk about fishing content like how to shoot fishing content how to actually do this because there's so much stuff about how to be a youtuber just to like do face like face talking videos but not about being the outdoor and what you need if you like i'll put a poll up on my channel let's see if that's something we like maybe i can get him back in we could maybe do a live stream where we just like talk about this stuff because i i do things it's fascinating about camera setup stuff like was this all like looking at this video was this all with just your sony or did you use any gopro footage with mixing with the drone or so you you see the drone that's uh i think a spark a dgi spark uh then I have the GoPro. Um, some of those underwater shots are actually shot with the dome. So that uh, keeps the, the water off of the lens by about six inches. So it's a domed lens. Interesting. Okay. So that's how you get that shot. Um, if you go a little later in the video, I don't know if you can find it, but where it's half in out of the water um, and the, that right there. Yeah. Mm. So that shot right there shot with the dome lens okay. and uh, it just pushes the water away from the lens. So you can get that, that, uh, that split view because if you uh -huh. don't have that you won't be able to get that with a uh, regular gopro gotcha gotcha, so gotcha. The clarity yeah yeah so, so the cool. clarity the fact that there's uh the distance in between the lens and the water mm. gives you uh enough uh the Perfect. field of view Correct. so you're i don't know you're shooting at a wide angle lens and you mm. have like 120 um and degrees this is of with the go this is a that's a gopro, the GoPro. yeah okay, that's yeah. one of the gopros and are you shooting in in are you shooting in wide like what setting on the yeah GoPro so i'm just using, using a wide and i shoot everything in 60 frames per second okay. when i when i do majority of any of my videos 60 frames um allows you to slow it down half so um in regards to frames per second, it's really simple to understand. You have uh, your timeline is your video, and that's going to be shot in 24 or 30 frames per second. So when you shoot in 60 frames per second, you can slow down or go slow-mo half of the original speed. So when I'm shooting at 60, I can say speed, take the speed of the video and slow it down to 50%, and then I get slow-mo while still being able to uh, have that correct flow. Mm. to the video without it being jittery and choppy do you shoot uh with with everything do you shoot in 4k do you ever shoot in 1080p um now it just depends so like when i'm sitting and talking to the camera and stuff and i know i'm never going to slow it down i'll shoot 4k every time but if i know i'm going to be in the uh out and about this camera only shoots 4k in uh 30 frames per second or 24 frames per second so i'll shoot uh 1440 um that's just hd like 1080p but it mine goes all the way up to 1440 and that goes to 60 to 120 frames per second and 120 frames per second just allows you slow it down even farther uh, all the way down to like an eighth almost okay. give or take yeah the original and, uh, speed. Like, this is you have like when you're yeah. shooting like, some of these videos like yeah. that thing is like uploading it to youtube mm -hmm. like you, you could probably like, if you're going to render it i use adobe premiere but like so then you also think about that so it's yeah. like if i shoot in 1080p and try to render in 1080p i can get the video out faster mm -hmm. if i try to shoot it at, at a higher quality mm -hmm. it's like not only is it it's just gonna take a lot longer take to longer, render and then right. upload it to youtube mm -hmm. and all that other stuff and it just it, you know it, that compromise it, it is and yeah, i just that's, that's all so much fun it's, yeah it's so fascinating i'm blessed to have a decent computer that can handle it um, I just have a laptop, but I mean, it's got to have like a high enough GPU, integrated graphics card, stuff that can handle that that 4K stuff because like, it does get hot and it mm. does slow down sometimes. And uh, I mean, anybody that uses Adobe Premiere Pro knows that there's so many glitches and yeah, and uh, yeah. It, it just rat randomly shut off on you. So, but definitely shooting in that 4K, I mean, your video just turns out so much better. Oh, and that's yeah. honestly why I'm going to be making the switch up to the the seven series, the Sony A7 series. Um, so, awesome. Yeah, that that's that's really cool. I mean, so we yeah. we talked about supporting you on your national fishing run. If somebody has wants to do a commercial, yes, or sir. wants to do a wedding or something, or anything, if you want him with a camera, <laughs> what, how do they reach out? To um, you for that? I will put my email. I'll give him my email, and mm -hmm. uh, we can put that in the description. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just shoot me an email. Mm -hmm. um, honestly, you can put my phone number on there too. Really, if 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 you know them personally, mm -hmm. but uh, easiest to contact me through our Instagram or email, and just uh, talk. Awesome. And, and then do you have any socials you want us to plug? Too? Um, honestly, just the four brothers outdoors is really all I post my, uh, fishing content to. Okay. Um, that's, that's it right now. So four brothers outdoors, we'll be doing a rebrand soon, most likely with the name and the logo, um, focusing more on that documentary series, telling stories instead of just 
mm-hmm. telling fish catches. I want to I want to get behind the uh, mm-hmm. the details and I want to mm-hmm. hear what other people have to think and mm-hmm. their experience because I, I feel like uh, yes, having that POV shot of me catching a fish is awesome, but like hearing how I got to that position or how somebody ended mm-hmm. up catching the state record or something along those lines. Like Tommy said in his video, he's been doing that for 20 plus years. And he turned out the South River Fly Shop and he started that 10 years ago. And ever since it's brought millions, you know, not millions, but thousands of people fishing to that area. And I I wanna hear more about that. So that's that's gonna be our goal going forward for me and my videography is letting other people uh, express their stories through, through video. That's awesome. That's like I, I, I got nothing. That's a great way to yeah, cap this sucker off. Thank Guys, you, Ryan. yeah, Ryan, thank you so much. This is a real treat more than ways than one. Please like and subscribe to his channel. Please comment fishing the DMV. Send him there. Please let's get this guy closer to a thousand subs. Please get his services. And again, guys, please like this. Try to get it up to 30 likes. We really want to hit that. And also leave a comment down below. I'll try to get to it unless you're doing those weird ass racial slurs like people have been doing. You know who you are. And there is a prize. If you comment and I like your comment, you might win a prize by the end of July. We are the fastest growing outdoor podcast and radio show in the greater DC area. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Aarons, and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.